This is the York Rock, Texas Fraternal Spotlight for April the 26th, 2020. Today we're spotlighting H. Bart Henderson. We have uh, with us today, we have uh, the most illustrious Grand Master of the Grand Council of Texas, Don Paul Payton. Right Worshipful Brother Jim Rumsey from the Committee on Work for the Grand Lodge of Texas. The Senior Warden of the Grand Commandery of Texas, Chance Chapman. And our great brother, Billy Hamilton, who's a member of 148 and on a lot of committees. So doing a good job out there. And uh, like I said, we will be fraternal spotlighting past Grand, Master, past Grand Commander of the Grand Commandery of Texas, H. Bart Henderson. Thanks for joining us tonight, Bart. Yes, sir. A uh, few people have been sending me messages or calling, texting, what have you, wondering what we can do to better prepare, if anything, for the next pandemic that hits us or a second spike in this one. So I want to get y'all's thoughts on that one. Well, uh, I'll start. Um, I would think that Obviously, the computer and these Zoom meetings, and I have to confess on tape here that this is only about the third or fourth time that I've been able to use one of these. I didn't know it even existed. I think it's a great idea. The problem to me is that if you want representation from your members, whether it's the lodge, chapter council, or commandery, number one, you're going to have to make sure that everybody has a computer. And number two, they know how to use it. And that's my only concern uh, beyond the security. I've heard, I've only heard, I've never experienced uh, issues with security and people uh, uh, hacking into some of these Zoom meetings. Uh, so I, I think that's an issue, but you know, but I, I do like the idea. And if we're going to prepare, which I think we should, but I think those are some items that probably need to be addressed because I'm not sure how many, let's just say, um, critical topics and votes that are taken in a lodge, if somebody's not able to participate, would that be legal? So I've got a follow up to that, Bart, if you don't mind. Sure. So let's talk about the business of a lodge. And I'm not, I'm not singling you out. I'm on, this is for discussion. Yes. So is the business of a lodge really so sensitive that Zoom would not be appropriate for when it's good enough for a doctor's office to use a doctor-patient visit uh, and, and discuss very sensitive information? Well, I guess I was referring to not the what I would call the normal business of the lodge. I mean, you know, we've all sat through those meetings where you pay the bills and discuss a few committee reports, et cetera. But at the same time, uh, like if you had an issue with a member uh, or if we had the, the thought of maybe selling the lodge or moving to another lodge and people venting their issues about the possible location that you're music, moving to, then I, I, my concern would be, gosh, maybe they wouldn't want to say that on the air. Now, I'm going to completely agree with you on that, but just the mundane, I hate to call it mundane, but just the ordinary business of a lodge. Oh, I have no issues. But, but again, I would like to see, you know, we're, if you have a vote, like uh, you're supposed to uh, uh, notify, if it's a, what I call a critical issue, you're supposed to notify your membership 30 days in advance and give them plenty of notice, et cetera. Anybody else? Anybody else have, anybody else have thought of that? Sure, I do. Uh, um, I don't mind doing stuff like this where guys can get together and discuss stuff, whatever. Uh, but not. A, I have an issue when it comes to having a meeting <clears throat> via Zoom, due to if we get in the norm of conducting business via Zoom, then it then we go back to regular, and it's like, well you know, uh, why do we have buildings anymore whenever we can conduct business on a computer just like this? Well, why do we need to invest in uh, our 
park and lot and lodge building, so forth, stuff like that. So when it's a lot more convenient like this, where we just logged in at two o'clock and said, hey, guess what, guys, here we all are. Uh, I don't agree with that. I don't like that. I don't like, uh, per se, if you had a session or a, a grand session of some sort, you know, via computer, uh, I, I just don't like that scenario happening because uh, people are limited in who, uh, kind of Bart relate to it, people that can get on uh, online and know how to do the Zoom thing here. If you consider our average member of a Mason being, what is it, Jim? You know these things off the top of your head. Average age is 66 years old. 66 years old. So a lot of guys don't know what Zoom is, don't know how to participate. And if you were having a session of some sort, uh, the typical guys that would go to the session that have been going for the last 40 years, you know, you're – it's it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. No, I, I actually agree with that. I don't think it would be proper to do a, anything that would be considered a secret ballot or a secret vote or a, a written ballot or written vote. Uh, nothing more than a show of hands, obviously. Uh, but let's think outside the box for a minute. Not just think about the lodge, the chapter, the council, or the commandery, but how many businesses, Don Paul, are asking themselves that very question right now? Why do we still have a building that we're paying for if we can conduct business virtually and not have to have the brick and mortar investment? That's uh, our sales. Uh, you, you know, we've, we're pretty fortunate. We're essential here at the store, you know. So we've been open through the whole uh, problem, the pandemic that we've had. And, you know, it's, it's slowed down quite a bit, but uh, our online sales have really taken off more than, you know, like a Christmas season per se, which is pretty busy. Uh, you And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens whenever uh, Abbott talks on Monday and says, hey, you know, open in other aspects, uh, you know, what's going to be the norm? What about lodges? People sitting in lodges next to you. So, the, uh, I'm in the oil industry, and we all know the oil industry is taking a huge hit on oil prices. But independent of the prices, you know, our corporate office is in Dallas County, and it's been closed for six weeks. We've got 2,000 employees who are working from home virtually, and productivity hasn't been interrupted. The guys in the field are still working in the field, but the corporate office, which has been, you know, you got 2,000 folks coming to work every day in the same building. Why? whenever you're still being as productive and still making the money you would make and being with everyone being at their house, working in their own hours, we are wearing out uh, this zoom software and, and similar teleconference software. Uh, it's becoming, I hate to say this catchphrase because it's, I hate it, but the new norm is actually going to impact businesses going forward because there's a different way of doing things that's been proven now to be productive and effective. So I wonder how that's going to trickle through our lodges over time. Whenever all this is over, whenever we can meet again, we got those key guys in every lodge. You got a group of guys who like the social interaction. You got a group of guys that deal with just the business aspect of the lodge, independent of the ritual and uh, social gatherings mm -hmm. and esoteric discussions. The business guys, I think, I foresee the business of a lodge being handled much differently moving forward. Our meetings becoming more ritual based, education or esoteric based, and social based. What are your thoughts? Well, what you just said something. Uh, I went to Academy today to go buy some fishing lures, take the boys fishing today. Pulled up in the parking lot, and there's people lined up, and they're six feet away. And first thing I thought, there is no way I'm waiting in that line. I'll just go home, order it online, and have it in a day. So uh, it's going to be interesting, but you, my, our business here is based on a, a customer service. And just like you relate to, you know, uh, most of the guys that I've known in May Spring lack to communicate face to face with uh, one another, whether it be visiting a lodge or going, whatever you're doing, uh, it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah. And I think we have to remember that we're not a business. We are a fraternity and for many of our members, we're an escape from reality uh, to go to lodge and uh, see the brothers or do the ritual work or listen to the minutes, whatever it is. It's an escape from the reality that we live in for a lot of people. Uh, so I think 
while businesses and the outside world might be shifting their focus into a more of a online based or um, work from home kind of situation, I think lodges are really going to see a big bump in that aspect that we're an escape from that. We get to see each other. We get to uh, meet together in person. I think that's going to be a huge draw for a lot of people. So I agree with Bart. We have to be better prepared for the online side of this for when this does happen again. Uh, and whether that's continuing with uh, these podcasts that we've started doing and several other brothers in, in Texas alone are doing similar ones or the, the educational aspect of it being done through these Zoom meetings or uh, the, the polls that our Committee on Work member has started uh, in his little group on Facebook. I think if we continue that going forward, we are going to be better prepared for when we have to do this again. That uh, that little group you talked about just talked a thousand <laughs> members this weekend. Little group. congratulations, very worshipful. So you don't think it's both though? You don't think it's uh, not just a fraternity, but also a business? Well, don't mistake me. We are not a business necessarily. We are a business-like charity. Because does. whenever you look at whenever you look at the way the lodge is structured with the worshipful master, a secretary, and a treasurer, and then the different uh, chairs that the officers sit in, it's basically structured like a business. It is, but we don't sell anything. We don't have outside customers, nothing like that. We are a fraternity deep down, and we have business-like tendencies that we have to take care of to maintain the fraternity, but that's not the main aspect of the fraternity. I think uh, you and Ricky might be having a little family squirrel here. You know, uh, <laughs> I just think we do sell something. So, well, actually, and and I, I'm not sure if I agree. We actually sell something. I, I believe we definitely offer something, right? Right. We, we do have something to offer, but we don't necessarily promote it. Uh, I, I think we are in a way set up, almost, you know, with a, a very streamlined officer business setup uh i i think really just just make sure that we can perpetuate the craft right not necessarily for we're not looking to turn a profit or anything like that mm -hmm. um i i think we we really kind of have a business model set up for preservation and that's it uh, when it comes to the meetings though i think we may be surprised at the end of this that we see maybe an uptick in people that are going to lodge uh, because I don't know about y'all, but I'm getting stir crazy. I can't wait to go back to lodge. Um, it could be the worst meeting ever, but I'm going to be happy just to sit there. Uh, and when I was looking yes. at the um, at the proceedings of the Grand Encampment Triennial from 1925, they were doing a report on membership in the different states between 1918 and 1922. And one of the interesting things is that you saw explosive growth there. And a lot of people say, well, it's from the soldiers coming back from the war. But at the time, you also had the Spanish influenza pandemic. Uh, and I feel that because there were a lot of people in a similar situation like we are now, there were a lot of places that did social distancing. Uh, I think people saw the value of having that personal connection and going to lodge that led to the growth of the fraternity much more than the number of soldiers that were coming back from World War One, right? Because the number of soldiers would have been a small percentage, but you saw growth that outnumbered that small percentage of, of members of the military. I, Billy, I actually agree. Uh, the, the Spanish influenza is grossly overlooked as being at the same time as World War One when we saw a spike in activity and, mem and new membership. Uh, I think you're exactly right. I really hope that we are all right and that we see an increase in interest from our current members uh, after this is over. But there's a big part of me that really feels that we're going to see a big part of our guys who are uh, out of the habit of going to lodge that need to, they're going to need that little boost to get back in. I also fear our, our some of our older members uh, may be reluctant to uh, participate in social gatherings uh, of any number. Uh, the younger guys think they're bulletproof. That's just part of being young. I get that. Uh, nothing good or bad about it. It's just the way it is. Uh, 
and the, the guys who regularly participate, like Billy, for example, do want to, and all of us are looking forward to getting back in the lodge. But the question is, I'm going to ask this to Billy, are we the average member? No, I, I, I would say that we're not necessarily the, the average member, and not out of some feeling of elitism or anything like that. Uh, I think we're we're definitely more active because we've chosen to be active uh, because for whatever reason it, it speaks to us and, and it lights a fire in us. Um, you know, there's a lot of members that I think are very casual with masonry and, and you know what, that's fine. Honestly, you know, we need all levels of commitment there. Uh, but I think we may come out of this and there's a lot of people who find that it means more to them than they thought it did before they weren't able to participate. Outstanding. So I got the next discussion question, and this came from Facebook also. Uh, this one is, uh, I want you to think outside of the realm of chapter council and commandery. Let's talk about your uh, lodge for a moment. Uh, the charge that's given to a worshipful master at the installation ceremony uh, specifies that and ask him to agree to be a peaceable citizen, to conform to the laws, not to be concerned in plots and conspiracies against government, to patiently submit to the Supreme Legislature, and to pay proper respect to the civil magistrates. So all those are they're, they're kind of hodgepodge together for this context. If you look at the installation ceremony, those are all independent questions that the part of the charge, the worshipful master during the installation that he's, he's supposed to uh, agree to before being installed. Prior to the Civil War, uh, Freemasons, I'm not going to say they had a reputation, but the most, well, some, of our, some of our more famous Freemasons uh, were revolutionaries, both in the American Revolution, with all the Freemasons that were fighting for independence from Britain, and in the Texas Revolution, all the famous Freemasons who were actively fighting for Texas independence from Mexico. So do you guys feel uh, that with our current situation, uh, with civil orders in some of our uh, states and or counties, maybe even cities, that some may argue are trespassing against the constitutional freedoms of an American, uh, do you feel that this charge to the worshipful master uh, is contrary to the actions, attitudes, or beliefs of the founding Masonic fathers, both of the United States and of Texas? Well, it, it, yeah, certainly in my opinion, I think our grandmaster, our current grandmaster, Paul Underwood, most worshipful Paul Underwood, is doing a great job of following exactly what uh, our local governments or the state government, even the president of the United States is asking of us. And he has uh, been very vocal on his uh, uh, podcasts, which I, I very much enjoy listening to because at least he keeps us informed of what's going on uh, currently. And uh, I, I just, I think he's a great example of following exactly what we're told to do to the letter. However, uh, I do think that there are circumstances, I don't want to call it plots against uh, uh, our government, but at the same time, I think it's maybe our responsibility to voice our opinion uh, last Friday, there was uh, over 100, maybe close to 200 people that did an open Texas protest in downtown Houston. I think Dallas had one as well uh, on the steps of the courthouse. And I don't think that's any plot against them. You're just merely voicing your opinion. Uh, certainly, I think there was a tea party about this a few years ago. I, I just think that uh, if we don't we shouldn't be patsies just to lay down and roll over and let the government, um, you know, take advantage of these situations. I think, for example, there, there are counties, many counties in Texas that aren't even affected by this COVID virus, unfortunately are being subject or subject to being shut down totally. I don't see the, the need for that. Now, if you're, 
you know, of course the entire t state of Texas has less um, COVID virus uh, issues than like five or six states in the Northeast section there. But at the same time, I, I, I just think that we need to take a look at this uh, on an individual basis. As far as our fraternity goes, it would be very difficult for the Grand Master or anybody else to say, well, we're going to let Dallas County and Tarrant County open, but Harris County cannot. So I don't think we should micromanage it. And again, I think the Grand Master is doing a great job. I just, I don't like the idea of, you know, throwing us all in the same pot as, uh, say, Louisiana, who's having a terrible problem with this. Or, or New York or New Jersey or other states or other jurisdictions? Well, kind of going back to what Bart just said, look at uh, doing it by county or even by city instead of having Big Brother tell you what you need to do. I always, uh, this, the last Saturday in April has always been Bob Wills weekend in Turkey, Texas, which is a huge booming revenue for uh, that uh, great town there in God's country. Of course, it was canceled. There's not one case in all of Hall County. Now, be it that Hall County has about 3,000 people in it, <laughs> but there's not one case, but they're uh, abiding by whatever habit, you know, the same stipulations we are uh, here in uh, even Weatherford, uh, which is crazy to me. Uh, but how do you, you know, if, uh, if they did it to where a city, I think there's a city in, uh, Dallas Colleyville or somewhere that opened up the patios, the restaurants. Is that right? Yes. So what if the people, if you're in lockdown in say Justin or Louisville or wherever Irving, you're like, I want to go and have a dinner on the patio. So you're going to drive to Colleyville. Of course they showed cars in that place. They were packed in there. I had to wait like three hours to go eat on the patio. You know, uh, I don't know. Big Brother shouldn't tell us what to do, but you got to be smart about what you're doing. And Colleyville's over there by North Richland Hills and Grapevine, so people are driving from Rockwall and Garland and all over just to go because they want to get out. Yeah, and to be technical, Colleyville's in Tarrant County, not Dallas County. Correct. Wait. So if, Wait. if I could offer maybe a, a dissenting opinion on this, I'm wondering if the charge is maybe – to prevent a worshipful master from becoming a demagogue, right? And uh, because especially, you know, when this was written, uh, the master of a lodge would have had a significant position. He would have been, he would have had uh, very much a, a leadership position in the community. And maybe it's a way to prevent one person from using that uh, influence for nefarious reasons. Yeah, and perhaps that's why it's in the charge. But yeah, obviously, you know, we had brothers who were part of instigating these, these great movements that created the history of our country and our state. Um, but, but maybe this is a charge to the worshipful master of, you know, be aware of your position and don't use it for personal gain. Yeah, I think it's symbolic as well as a practical charge to an extent. Um, you know, I've questioned this before uh, because, as you point out, it's kind of a contradiction that we're telling Masons today, hey, <clears throat> don't, don't do the things that our country's founding fathers did, who were Masons, uh, you know, rebel against the government. What's changed? And a lot of it is that I've been told back was, well, when the government starts rebelling against you, that's when you take action. When the government starts rebelling against what it, it has in writing of what it can and cannot do, and it's doing those cannot do things, it's time to restart that government process all over again. And that's basically what the founding fathers did, if you think about it. You know, um, they initially, they just wanted the representation with all the taxes that were being added to them. And they weren't getting it, um, even though they were basically promised in a way that they would be represented. So when the government no longer worked for them, even though it was supposed to be, I think that's kind of on the track that this was put in place for. 
So Chance, uh, I love you, but I disagree with you. That's fine. That, that's a very politically correct answer, and, I, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> that's two but, people that's disagreed with him today. But here's the, here's, the, here's the reality I want you to think about. Those famous Freemason founding fathers, whether the United States of America founding fathers or Republic of Texas founding fathers who were Freemasons, they rebelled against the government, and then they became the government. Right. So once you become the government, you don't want people rebelling against you. So you change the, the fraternity to say, it's not right to rebel against government because we yes. allow the government. Yeah. And, and that's why I think today it's more of a symbolic uh, charge than anything else. But. Well, Mark, uh, this one, question for you. This one kind of hits back what we're talking about. Uh, I know you're pretty active with the Fort Worth, uh, Fort Worth, you can only wish, uh, the Houston Livestock Rodeo. Uh, that affected y'all when they shut that sucker down, and that thing brings in millions and millions of dollars for Houston. How? I mean, did they just call you and say, hey, guess what? We're shutting it down. See y'all next year? I mean, what about all the people, the exhibitors? Um, well, they uh... – as far as the exhibitors went, they took it on the chin. I have to be very careful on I, I, who knows who watches this podcast. I hope lots of people, but they told us to be very careful on how we vocalize our feelings about that. I will tell you this, that this year we celebrated the issuance of $500 million in scholarships since the beginning of the scholarship program at the livestock show. However, um, it's just my opinion and my observation that I, I think I think the, the the need of taking care or precautions was definitely there and, and needed. However, um, there was a whole lot of money involved uh, with taking steps to uh, stop activities in your local cities and counties, et cetera. In fact, um, that announcement to close the rodeo came within 24 to 36 hours after the president announced that he was going to give uh, $8 million or $8 billion or whatever it was, probably billion, uh, in monies to cities and counties that took actions to stop the spread. Well, I think Houston garnered about the city of Houston, not the county, but the city of Houston got, got about $5 million for taking steps to close the rodeo. And there was a large, a very large, very popular bike ride that they stopped. And he, the count, the city made $5 million out of that. I will tell you this, that just yesterday or tomorrow, I'm not sure it's this weekend sometime, uh, they're closing that. Uh, temporary, I call it a mash type hospital that they opened uh, there on the rodeo grounds uh, out by NRG Stadium that never acquired one single patient that cost us millions of dollars to put up. And uh, just in prep, uh, just in uh, preparation um, for this COVID virus thing. So I, you know, I don't mind taking steps of precaution to answer your question more specifically. Uh, the vendors lost everything. Uh, now they did the rodeo set up, they set up uh, with the permission of the rodeo, some websites to purchase items that would have been available to you at the rodeo. We did get one week in, uh, one week of rodeo in. So we only lost two weeks, but that's two thirds of the revenue that would have been generated for scholarships, et cetera. So uh, to me, and I, I really feel bad about the vendors, but the real victims of this were the kids and the contestants that came to participate with the rodeo, whether it be in uh, barrel racing or uh, bulldogging or uh, horseback, I mean, uh, uh, bull riding or, bucking bronx whatever uh, and the kids that raised an animal or multiple animals different species to come and show them they raised them all year long to have that three minutes in an arena and it's gone 
irreplaceable. So some of that has gone to online uh, auctions and or raffles. They uh, did a great job with raffles. You can buy a, a chance to buy this animal for 50 bucks or 100 bucks a chance. And uh, that, that's been very successful. Well, the, the bad thing about the whole scholarship thing, as you know, in Fort Worth, uh, the rodeo here and the stock show happened before. This Luckily. Was crazy. And we had the freaking record record number. I think it sold for over $300,000 the championship steer here. And the reserve champion sold for like 200 and something thousand. So I would have figured Houston would have also, and it's because the economy was great. And I figured Houston would have probably had some of the same statistics there with their grand champion and reserve champion. Well, I, I think uh, Ricky, to hit on what Ricky said there, I, I don't know if the steers there in Houston would have brought as much as Fort Worth since Fort Worth is the oldest continuously running livestock show and rodeo. Right. Uh, since 1896, unlike Houston, uh, plus, uh, that's just jacking with you there. I, I know that. And, <laughs> I took it in jest. And the ones in, uh, Fort Worth were Herefords, which was, uh, pretty crazy since 1980 something. Of course, I'm pretty partial to Herefords since that's what I raised. So today let's, uh, let's get into our uh, episode content today. Like I said earlier, uh, I'd like to introduce our special guest, uh, which is past Grand Commander of the Grand Commander of Texas, <laughs> Bart Henderson. Um, the uh, we're doing a guest spotlight on him, and do uh, we have uh, your Masonic bio? So uh, Masonic bio for H. Bart Henderson. What is uh, Howard Bart Henderson? That's what the H is. I never knew that. I've known you a long time. You know, my my close friends call me Howie, yeah. and you may do so as well. <laughs> Uh, so it talks uh, a member of Woodland Lodge, uh, 1157, raised July 31st, 1986 in that lodge. Yep. Also member of Bel Air Lodge there in Houston and Demolay Lodge, number 199 in San Antonio. Yes, sir. All right. Plus, uh, like uh, your bio here has several things that would take weeks and months for us to go through and dissect everything for everything that you've done uh, for, you know, Grand Lodge committees to, you know, chapter council commandery. So the Yorkrat stuff, <clears throat> member of William Kidd, chapter number 424, Royal Arch Masons uh, in San Jacinto Council, number 347. And Ruthven Commandery Number Two, knighted September the twenty fifth, nineteen eighty seven. Yes. Chance, what year were you born? Oh, eighty nine. Eighty nine. <laughs> so nineteen eighty seven. I was in kindergarten. Jim, what grade were you in? First or kindergarten? Eighty seven. I was in a uh, fourth grade. Fourth grade. Okay. I was six. <clears throat> so anyway, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we have Knight Mason Councils, AMD, uh, High Priesthood, Order of the Civil Trial, Super Excellent Master's Degree, Sovereign uh, Knights Preceptor, uh, Red Cross of Constantine, uh, St. Thomas of Bacon, uh, KYCH, uh, Past High Priest of William Kidd, 93 and 94, Pastor District Deputy Grand High Priest, 2003, uh, Past Thrice Illustrious Master, 92-93, and uh, Past District Deputy of the Grand Council, 1997. Who was that for? Tom Snyder. Tom Snyder. Well, Thomas <laughs> Wonderful Snyder, excuse me. There you go. <laughs> uh, like I said, your bio, member of Rosicrucian, it uh, just goes on and on. Uh, and so, uh, for, you were a uh, Grand Commander of Grand Commander of United Templar of Texas in... 13 and 14. 13 and 14. So who was, uh, you went in in 03? I went in uh, actually in 04. Jim Higdon, excuse me, uh, Jim Smith was ending his uh, term as Grand Commander there in Tyler. And that's when I ran for office and won. And uh, was very fortunate to win. I had a, a lot of big competition, I thought anyway. And uh, Jim Higdon was my uh, first Grand Commander to serve under. 
Okay, and where was it held at in Tyler? At the Holiday Inn uh, Conference Center there in that uh, highway, is it 94 or? It's, how, it's Highway 69. It's yeah. the same, same Holiday Inn we use for all the stuff in Tyler though. Yes, sir. The, uh, nice place. Yeah. And so we're going back to the uh, bio, uh, Purple Cross, um, Golden Keystone of the Grand Chapter in 2005. Uh, Scottish Rite bodies, 33rd degree. I mean, just you. I'm glad to see that you're finally getting active in masonry after reading this. Uh, I'm glad that you legitimized my age by saying uh, what I've at least been accomplished in those many years. <laughs> so Were you uh, governor of the York Rec College also? Uh, yes, I was. Uh, Grant, you, I was governor of my college in 90 something. Uh, and I was very fortunate to serve as deputy grand governor under, uh, gosh, I'll think of it in a moment. And then I followed it up Doy. by serving as grand governor. Was it Doy? No, yeah. uh, previous to Doy. Um, he's from Dallas. Grant, past grand commander or honorary grand commander. Um, <laughs> Lloyd Chinks. Uh, yes, Lloyd Chance. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I served as his deputy grand governor. And then uh, Doy became grand governor, and then I followed okay. Doy Suddeth. Um, and I have to tell you that serving as grand governor was maybe one of the offices that I, I had the most fun in doing. It was a national office. It was a state office uh, having control of uh, 13 colleges, which we were the largest dur jurisdiction, and I was extremely fortunate in getting to constitute a new college during my tenure, which is very rare. Uh, I had nothing to do with it, except I was grand governor, and uh, it, it was a real honor to do that, and I got to meet a lot of great people. In fact, that's where I first met Jim Rumsey, and if uh, Jim, you know, he's not going to tell you this, but he delivered at uh, Ascension. Uh, is it Ascension College? Or uh, no, it's uh, East, East Texas York Rite College. East Texas York Rite College delivered his part. I mean, and it was just amazing. And I told you after the meeting, I said your your delivery, your tone, and the rate of delivery was just the best I'd ever heard. Is that true? Uh, that is true. Uh, okay. I was, uh, I had a junior part, uh, but I'm a ritualist by nature. Yeah. And I took it very seriously. Well, it, uh, I appreciated uh, the comments from the grand governor. Of course I did. Well, it showed. And, and, and I, I tell everybody this, uh, when they, if you're a member of something, it's great that you're active in your particular body, whether it's the college chapter council commander, whatever, but you need to go visit other organizations of the same type just so you can see how they operate and and how they do things and uh it's just amazing the difference the the rituals the same but the the way that we or they do their how they do it is totally different sometimes but uh i i really enjoyed your part and uh, did a great job and it really affected me when i heard it. i thought dang that guy's good so uh you know i don't want to go to your head or anything too late. Yeah, <laughs> too late. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, Mark, when did you join and how old were you when you joined the fraternity? I was, uh, I was 29. Um, I was a senior DMLA. And after, you know, I aged out as a active DMLA, I went to school and got a job and focused on that. And, um, I, you know, Freemasonry while, while my chapter was, uh, sponsored by, uh, a lodge, I, it being a Freemason never really crossed my mind. They were a bunch of great group of guys, but, uh, and they did a lot of things for us, but it, you know, that wasn't on my mind at the time. It was getting a good job and starting a family, et cetera. And, I uh, met my, well, I met my, I was uh, introduced to Freemasonry from my father-in-law. Actually, I didn't have any, to my knowledge, I have no 
immediate family members that are members of Freemasonry. But my father-in-law was a very proud Scottish Rite Mason, wasn't active, but he was very proud. He was a, a very astute businessman and well-respected in, in Houston and Harris County. He was in the meat business and uh, the, particularly the sausage business at that time. And he was uh, given the uh, Knight Commander of the Court of Honor from the Houston Scottish Rite because of the example that he set for his industry. And at that moment, I got, I was, uh, at that time, I, I think I was still dating Linda, his daughter, and uh, uh, got to go to that banquet. And gosh, the way that people were talking to each other and treating each other and they honored each other, I thought, you know, that's kind of cool. And uh, I think I'd like to be a part of that. And then when we found out that I was a senior DMLA, they jumped all over it. So that's how that got started. So, Bart, I've got a follow-up question to that, if you don't mind. No. Uh, how did you get involved with Demolay if you didn't have any Master Masons to your knowledge in your in your family lineage? Uh, the high school that I went to uh, was a very small school. It was a private school. And uh, a lot of the, well, several of the guys were Demolays. Fathers were Masons. And uh, I, I played in multiple sports, and so did they. Of course, there wasn't many of us. But uh, they said, Hey, look, we've got a, an organization called Demolay. Uh, I'd like to invite you to a meeting. We met on Wednesday nights. Uh, a coat and tie would be preferable. If you don't have one, don't worry about it. Well, I obviously had one, but, uh, or had a coat and tie. So, uh, they picked me up, took me to the meeting and, uh, I liked what I saw, uh, very soon after that. I don't remember the time frame, but they had a rush party made sure that there were a lot of pretty girls there. Uh, all the guys, I mean, they had all kinds of cakes and cookies. I mean, they, they really did it right. And uh, they said, would you be interested in joining us? And I said, absolutely. So that's how I got started. So is that, was Demolay your first exposure to Freemasonry? It was. So you're you're a past master of Demolay Lodge in San Antonio. Yes. Uh, is that a is being a past master of that lodge directly related to you being a, a senior Demolay before joining the lodge? Um, I don't. Uh, Demolay One Ninety Nine was a reconstituted or re reinstituted lodge that had demised. Uh, Re uh, past Grand Master Resale Harrison was very instrumental in getting that started. And it was, as it restarted, was composed of all senior Demolays, except one. Uh, there was one token guy. <laughs> oh, that's what we called him. And, uh, but uh, it, it was all senior Demolays. And I thought, you know, if I'm going to drive, you know, three hours to get to this meeting, I'd like to be an officer. And I went through that line. What was funny about it, Jim, was um, they only meet quarterly. And at the end of my term, they had a few older, uh, really senior Demolays that went through the line before me, but they only served one year. Previous to that, it was a three-year term. And uh, so when I went through the line, it came time for uh, Re Reese L. Harrison was my chaplain. And it's a small lodge, so he sat right next to me. And uh, it came time for the election. He said, well, uh, I said, brethren, it's now time for our yearly election and uh, installation of officers. And Reese said, uh, I think you need to sit down. And I said, uh, he goes, worshipful master, I think you're out of order. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, you obviously didn't read the fine print. And I said, well, what, what fine print? And he said, uh, well, the fine print that said that uh, you, because we meet quarterly to get your 12 meetings in, you have to serve three years. Oh. And I said, uh, I, I guess I totally missed that. And he goes, well, you're not a lawyer. That's why you didn't pay attention. And so, uh, anyway, I served three years and it was a, it was fun. We had our own issues just like every lodge, but it was fun. And I, uh, I'm honored to have served there. So Bart, one final follow-up question to this one before we move into the next one. Sure. Uh, you mentioned your father-in-law. Yes. Uh, who, so your wife, how did you meet your wife? Uh, well, um, I had gone I had attended her high school's um, 
graduation ceremony. I was dating another girl at the time. And uh, I got the message. Well, she, the other girl said, hey, look, it's a graduation night. I'm going out with my girlfriends. Uh, you don't mind, do you? And I said, well, I guess not. So I, was, I, I knew several people from Linda's high school that I grew up with in the neighborhood here. And so we were kind of chatting around. And I saw this girl walking out with her parents. And she was attractive, obviously, in my mind. And, uh, but as a family unit, they just, it just, it looked right. I don't know how to explain that, but it did. And so, uh, the next day I was at my girlfriend's house and I said, Hey, look, you have your, uh, your high school directory. I'd like to see it. Cause they had pictures in there. So I flipped through her directory and found Linda's picture and her, and her name. And I didn't even know her name. And I guess I kind of stalked her in a way, but anyway, uh, <laughs> they, uh, I got her name and, phone number and called and I said uh, talk to her mother and told her mother I said you don't know me but my name is Bart Henderson and I'd like to uh, ask your daughter out and that's how we met. What about the other girlfriend? Well she got wind of that and I said well you know as a matter of fact uh, you instigated this by leaving me out of your graduation night uh, festivities so there you go. And I have to say that Linda is a doll. Yes, yeah, she is. And very patient. She puts up with me. And, and she invites me to dinner every once in a while. So yes, I'm a as a matter of fact, yeah. She's, uh, just coincidentally, uh, she was a rainbow girl. And uh, we both served on um, the Houston Heights chapters uh, rainbow board. I served as chairman. She was mother advisor many, many times. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we tried to carry on that banner of honoring the youth. So in your interactions as a Demolay, did you ever have any interchange with her as a rainbow girl? Never did. Okay. Thank you, Bart. You're up, DP. So uh, serving as grand commander, not still we're here in Texas, what are some of the things that you accomplished while a grand commander that, uh, you know, you're pretty proud of? Well, several things, uh, you know, when you serve in the grand commandery line, each you, we have, at that time, we had nine districts and you visit when you're that officer, you're assigned a district and you visit all of the commanderies in that district. Um, for nine years, I got to visit every commandery in the state and I noticed something. It was an ongoing issue that while the guys were really good at what they did, they didn't many, many times, they didn't have enough Sir Knights. Uh, it requires nine to open and uh, they, they'd have eight or seven, you know, and even if I helped, it wasn't enough. So uh, I tasked our um, night, uh, the Templar instruction committee, as well as a few other folks and uh, to come up with an opening for five that would allow, and in my mind would salvage, uh, I'm gonna guess with you at that time, it was probably six or seven commanderies that just didn't have the horsepower to, to open with nine. So they came up with a great uh, opening and it was, I mean, it looked snappy. And uh, they, the Grand Commandery, we exemplified it in very short form and uh, David Malir and uh, Gary Friedman and several others uh, from the Fort Worth area. I think chance, no uh, chance was not, but um, I was on the, I was on the long range planning committee that helped develop it, but that's the year oh. I was well, look, elected. So, that's right. Yeah. So I, I was outside the door when that was uh, well, and that's being okay. demonstrated strategically. <laughs> yes. But it, 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 that came off and I think it worked for a while. Unfortunately, some of those commanderies just, they didn't focus enough on the membership end of it and end up closing anyway. But we, we did that. Um, I had a membership program that um, I came up with all on my own and I uh, had a, a great membership committee. Uh, the commanderies really bought into it. Uh, we advertised it. Or I tried to bring it up every chance I got. We had the, according to the grand recorder, Jerry Kirby, uh, it was reported that we had the best membership year in 40 years that year. Now, uh, for whatever reason, they chose uh, to do something different, but, and that's fine, you know, but um, I was really proud of that fact. 
and we didn't we didn't tweak any numbers we didn't um, you know there was no gray area we we had a plan we and, and we executed it and it was uh, worked out really good we also had um, I had a field day uh, we conferred the orders at a at a castle in Burnett, Texas, and we also invited the Texas DMLA to do the same, and they conferred the Order of DMLA, or the Initiatory Degree, I think, uh, at this same castle the same weekend. It was, a uh, we tried to call it a Templar weekend, and and uh, it was, uh, I thought it was a success. We didn't have the numbers that we wanted, but we still had several people show up. The two things that I didn't accomplish, but we just ran out of time was <laughs> I had a fundraiser. One of my committees at the rodeo is the wine committee. And as a fundraiser for the grand commandery, I was trying desperately to get this done. Uh, but we ran out of time and the vintner that I was utilizing went out of business about six or eight weeks before my grand commandery session. So it didn't. It just didn't happen. But it, we were developing a um, a wine for the to be utilized not just by Texas, but by other jurisdictions. And uh, we had the name of it. It was called the Fifth Libation. We had a. I still own the label rights to that, uh, and it was to be utilized by any commandery, and all the uh, the revenue from that, or not revenue, but all the profits were to go to the Grand Commandery of Texas. When can we expect that label to be public? <laughs> well, if, if somebody wanted to utilize that in, I guess, the Grand Commandery uh, to UB, it, it was a, let me tell you, we did a lot of research on it and we had a great wine. And I had all the officers at my mid-year meeting taste that wine and they all, they had a choice of three and they all concluded this one particular one. I can't remember what it was now, but it, they all liked it. And we were going forward with that and then the Vintner closed but I didn't get that done. And then I was working or attempting to work with uh, the Dallas Scottish Rite and uh, the Texas DMLA. And of course me as grand commander, we were trying to have a, a special focus on the Templar degrees of the Scottish Rite. And uh, the, the, apparently the Dallas Scottish Rite has a public uh, ceremonies for those or something that we could have shared with the DMLA boys to show them that I, my goal was to show them that there was, there was life after DMLA and to be a Mason was an honor and that you could be involved and still be a part of either the York Rite or the Scottish Rite because they both had influences on the order of DMLA and uh, the Scottish Rite 30th, 31st and 32nd degrees are Templar degrees. And, uh, I just wanted to show the kids that, and we, that just didn't happen. We ran out of time. Actually, we didn't have too many people buy into it because the time that I had planned it was um, like on Memorial Day weekend, and it just it was poorly planned on my part. But that I still think that that has some um, merit. Well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, seems like you had a pretty active year. My I had a great year. Uh, we, I, I, I thought we'd had. Uh, we did a, a cornerstone laying for Henry Bates Stoddard, a uh, past grand commander from um, El Paso. And I mean, excuse me, from a college station. Excuse me. And the grand master of the grand encampment. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. And Ken Fisher, uh, past grand commander, past grand master Ken Fisher was very instrumental in helping with that. But it's we haven't done one of those since then that I that I know of. So, Bart, this kind of leads into my next question. Uh, a lot of uh, knights, Sir Knights don't know this. And why do Grand Commanders, as soon as they are installed in office, issue general orders? What, why, why do this? Why do they do that? Well, I'm going to guess with you that you as Grand Master of the Grand Council or any other presiding officer, you, you're inundated the first month or eight weeks, uh, six, eight weeks of your office. Hey, can we do this? Can we do that? And I think that the Grand Commandery issues those general orders. Uh, for example, general order number one uh, identifies, if I'm not mistaken, chance you'll have to, or Ricky, you can correct me, if you just feel at will, but uh, I, you, uh, that's your, it's general order number one, identifies the officers and um, what you can do as far as, uh, uh, you know, you're given uh, 
dispensation to appear uh, in public or in a parade or whatever uh, to say the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas flag and stuff like that. The general orders is just general information to be given to all the commanderies and it's just like automatic. It's just well, go ahead. It's like a blanket dispensation for everybody. That's, that's correct. Okay, because unlike us, you know, we're and the Grand Council, we, you know, uh, uh, a council wants to hold this meeting or this or that appear in public, you know, instead of doing a blanket one for do whatever you want. Right. We do individually. Right. And it identifies the officers and what jurisdictions that they're responsible for and their contact information, et cetera. I, I, I didn't devise it. I, that's been going on for many, many years, but I think it's a very smart way of doing things. Uh, that way everybody gets the same information at the same time. Well, I've, I've, I know quite a few past grand commanders that I don't even know the answer to why they do all those things. And, uh, I knew you were going to be our guest, so I said, hell, I'll just ask you. <laughs> <laughs> well, even a, even a blind squirrel finds a nut occasionally. <clears throat> All right, Bart, I have the next question, and right. that is, you are obviously a very strong supporter of our Masonic youth, as you've mentioned several times so far. Um, can you tell us of your involvement, not only as a youth, but as an adult, and how the organizations relate to York Ride Masonry? How the youth organizations relate? Yes, how the youth organizations relate to York Rite Masonry. Well, um, yeah, I'm Chance, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I, I served as the chairman of youth activities for the Grand Lodge of Texas for all seven years. I think I'm the only one that's ever done that. I think so. And uh, it, was a, it was a position of honor, I thought. And I began every one of my reports. That's when the chairman was still giving reports at Grand Lodge. And uh, I gave every one of my reports. And they all started off with, brethren, please pay attention. This will be the most important report that you hear this weekend because it involves your future. And uh, but we, you know, it was my thought that um, you, uh, the you as a youth, uh, because I got, yeah, you know, I, I'm one of those fortunate people that got to see people like you, uh, come up through the order of Demolay, preside over the Texas state Demolay. Uh, not everybody gets that chance, but I, I got to see it. And then, um, it was my thought that as chairman of youth activities, we were the liaison between the youth organizations and the Grand Lodge of Texas. And if we're going to do it, let's do it right. And so I, I tried to utilize the presiding officers at one time was you and tried mm -hmm. to give you as much uh, input as I possibly could. Uh, this, this is what we ought to do. What do you think? And if you didn't like it, you could say, Hey, well, I really wasn't thinking about that. I want to do this. Well, if we could do it, I tried to allow that. And uh, I, you know, to me, the Grand Lodge of Texas, uh, the Grand Chapter, Grand Council, and Grand Commandery, the, in my opinion, within reason, the more emphasis we give to the young people, the better officers or members and hopefully officers they'll be of our organization. And, you know, um, I don't know that you were there, but Ronnie Seal was the Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite of the Southern Jurisdiction a few years ago, he appeared in Galveston, <coughs> pardon me, for their, I think it was their 175th anniversary or 100. Uh, it should have been the bicentennial, was it? Uh, you know, I don't remember. It was, a, it was a big event. Yeah. And Brack really played it up, and we have all had this dinner at a nice restaurant there, and it was very, very nice. But Ronnie Seal uh, shared this story, and it really hit home with me. And, of course, this was way after – I presided as grand commander, but it, it should hit home with everybody that told this story of this group of men that were cleaning out this building and they ran across, they were almost finished and they sat down for a break and they went through this file cabinet and this file cabinet was uh, from a lodge and they go, Hey, look, these guys were meeting uh, every month and they actually paid to sit through these meetings to hear these uh, minutes. And I wonder what happened to them. And it got really quiet. And so I, I think 
the message was for all of us, if we don't cultivate our future and give them and our members something to do besides sit there and listen to minutes that may or may not pertain to them personally, I think we're in for a very dark future. And I love that story. And I probably didn't retell it right, but the, the point is, um, and I like Jim Rumsey earlier made the comment to, to get out of the box of normality and do something different. And, uh, you know, you've got to follow the law, but just outside that, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that we can do. And I think involving our youth is uh, a priority, or at least should be. Hey, Bart, I was at that meeting in Galveston. Yes. Uh, that dinner. is a dinner in Galveston. Yes. And uh, Ronnie Seal was the keynote. Yes. And what struck me about that was right prior to that comment that you mentioned, he did a roll call. Uh, is so-and-so in the room, is so-and-so in the room, is so-and-so in the room. He went through about four or five names. And he said, oh, these are actually the names I took from the minutes of the charter meeting of the Galveston Valley. Wow. He went on to talk about how these names that we don't, we don't know, we don't associate with everyday life or even with Masonic history. These were the guys who were game players when the Galveston Valley was chartered and, and he went on to say, everyone who attends a meeting, regardless if you become Grandmaster or SGIG or whatnot, you are still significant because you were there when something started and you worked in the quarries. And that ties into the, the, the comment you just made about right after that, he talked about uh, that stuff you said. But yes. I mean, yeah. his, his speech was very short, yes. but it, it was very powerful because it made everyone in the room feel that if you attend a meeting, you're part of something special, regardless of what you go on to become. Yes. So that's not magical. Yeah. It had a lot of impact to me. I thought, wow, that that's, that was a heartfelt. And you, as you said, it was a very short presentation, but it had major league impact. So it looks like I got the next question, Bart. Okay. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was traveling the state. Uh, and you and I cross paths a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago about how you and I first met at a, at a York Rock College meeting in Tyler, Texas. We knew who each other were prior to the end, but we didn't really know each other. That's the first really connection that we had. And uh, since then, I, I'm going to venture to saying, please correct me if I'm wrong, that we develop a friendship since then. Yes. Uh, oh, absolutely. And uh, so, that, that's something that's really neat about uh, our fraternity is that people who never would have met uh, meet and through our fraternity and, and develop not just the, we're not just a Masonic brother, uh, we are friends. Uh, so my question to you is, aside from obviously from me, but what distinct friendships have our, has our fraternity uh, given to you, uh, and talk to us a little bit about that. Well, <laughs> we we don't have enough time to talk about that, and and I'll tell you why. One of the highlights of being, whether you're Grand Commander or Grand Master of the Grand Council or Grand High, it doesn't matter. Even just being an active member, you, you develop if you participate whatsoever in your organization, you're gonna meet a lot of neat people. There are some that may not be so neat or interesting, but most of them are, and they have a background that's can add something to the lodge if they are given a chance. Uh, you know, somebody like you that's a, a really a learned person or many people like you, it, it's just, uh, it, it all adds to the, to the health of the lodge and, and the wealth, not wealth is in monetary, but the wealth and, hey, I know somebody that can handle this for the lodge. We, we've kind of gotten away, and I'm speaking just in general terms. I know that there's some, and some lodges out there that are, as I call, hyperactive. They, they're doing everything, and they're many times doing it right. But there are some lodges that kind of lost the, uh, maybe the emphasis of what we're supposed to be doing and kind of maybe just going through the motions or whatever that we have our monthly meetings and 
occasionally we'll have a dinner or an honors night or whatever. But to me, I, I've met, your, your question was, how many friendships have I developed, if I got that correctly, through the lodge or through the free, uh, through Freemasonry? It, it, I can't name how many. I, I, I met Ricky Cox uh, through, I mean, through being active in the commandery. I, I installed a past commander of his commandery, Hobie Henderson, a few years before Ricky became an uh commander. I don't know if you were one of Hobie's officers or not, or were there that was there that night, but I, I just, I think that that Hobie, uh, you know, I, I took some, I don't want to call them gag gifts, but some, uh, I tried to add a little levity to, uh, to his installation. And, and I think they enjoyed it. I showed up at Ricky Cox's installation and tried to add a little levity to that. And, um, it, it's, it's, you know, it, the friendships don't always have to be business transactions, if that makes sense. Uh, Jim, you, you know, you've traveled a whole lot. Oh, is it, I don't know if you can see Ricky or not, but uh, that was one of the the gifts I gave him as uh, the newly installed commander. Uh, I think his wife likes to wear it more than he does. But uh, I, I just think that there's a whole lot more to our fraternity than meetings. And I hope that everybody feels the same way. I, you know, being grand commander was interesting and it was a lot of work, but I enjoy going to grand commandery just because it's, um, I think it's like a reu family reunion. Uh, you know, Jerry Kirby made the comment in his, uh, interview with y'all uh, that it's like a family reunion more so than a Masonic event. And, and I think that's true. So I, I just, I can't begin to name all the, the friendships that I've developed. And some of them are not as close as you and I, Jim, but you know, I mentioned Chance earlier. God, I got to watch him grow up as a skinny kid to the adult that he is and a Masonic leader that he is. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, you I got to take a, a moment of personal privilege here. Um, God, I, I met Bart, I assume in the 90s. I don't know. Uh, that's when Dad restarted Needle in Chapter 92, 93. And we've been going to state events ever since then. And Bart, Bart has done a whole bunch for Texas Steam Lake. And Dimoy International, he's an active member of the International Supreme Council, for those of you who don't know. And uh, he was director of Conclave, I don't know how many years, far. 19. Uh, I was about to say at least 15 years. And uh, for those of you who don't know the structure of Texas Dimoy, that's basically the number two uh, guy on the advisor side after the executive officer. And he was director of Conclave when I was state master counselor. And like he said, he gave us the option to – to have a say in it. And that meant so much to me. He was there the night I got my master's degree. Um, he's been at a whole bunch of things. The night I was getting in the York Wright college, he showed up. He was deputy grand governor at the time. And I said, what are you doing here? And he's like, well, I came to see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I, I was elected at his grand session in Houston in 2014 as grand sentinel and the shoulder boards and, uh, all the stuff that's passed down to the new Grand Sentinel comes from the Grand Commander. So to this day, I wear Bart's uh, regalia. And that means just so much to me because of the influence he's had on my life in masonry and outside of masonry as well. Uh, there's a lot of personal things that go on uh, between Bart and I that a lot of people don't know. Uh, he, he is one of the few people that really stepped up and helped my family when my grandfather was passing away back in 2012. And those are some stories we can talk about another time, but that's what the fraternity is about is people like Bart and his influence on people like me. So I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, I agree. Thank you, Chance. As uh, the, as y'all see my little headgear, it's got a little skull and crossbones on the side and yeah, Tiffany uses it when she rides her horse sometimes, but we had a, I met Bart several times before my installation, but uh, he uh, 
came to our York Rack College and everything, and I, I should be governor pretty soon, but with the COVID thing, uh, I don't know how that's going to work out. So the, uh, but at my installation, we had a, about 130 people there and it was pretty solemn and pretty, a little fancy, let's say, if that's a decent word for it. But Bart got up and, uh, as you say, Chance, uh, personal privilege. I believe a lot of people could say that about Bart. Uh, he made it funny where after we were done, people talked about the funny part at the end, whenever I got my little spiked helmet and the glow and sword and stuff. And uh, they said that made it, that totally topped it off. And, uh, and I agree. I think that not the best thing about, and we're not, this isn't a, uh, uh, Bart Henderson theme, but uh, since you are the guest here, the best thing about that I like about Bart is that not just is he a Mason whenever he knows you, he's your freaking friend. And uh, you can't ask for a much better friend than the type of guy Bart Henderson is. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Bart, the question that I have actually goes back to Jim's previous question about the friendships you've made. Yes. Uh, I was wondering do you have a Masonic mentor? Uh, and if so, do you have any one bit of advice that you would give to upcoming grand officers, uh, either from from your mentor or something that you've learned along your career? Billy, um, I, I have several mentors, uh, merely because, and, and I know that you know this, or if you don't know it, you will very soon, uh, that as you progress through your Masonic career, there's going to be people in your life or in your future that Im, Im, imbue or uh, uh, they, they provide insight that maybe you weren't looking for or you were searching for desperately and it just shows up. Uh, these people are very smart. They've got a lot of uh, experience. You know, um, we just mentioned Resell Harrison. Um, he, he's one, you know, you, you may or may not believe this, but, uh, Chance Chapman and his family, uh, man, I learned a lot from them. Uh, just, uh, his dad, Tommy, uh, past grandmaster, uh, Tommy Chapman and I served as deputies together for Thomas Snyder. That's when I really got to know Tommy better than I had previously known. And, uh, he's a mentor. I mean, these, and you're going to see this. And I think, I don't know what everybody else is saying on that, but I, Brian Dodson uh, has opened my eyes. Many times he's wrong, I got to tell you. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, he's opened my eyes to alternatives. Uh, in other words, uh, just because it's not in black and white in the law book, it makes you use your head and, and your common sense. And, and, and that's one thing that I've learned from Brian. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know. I've got several of them. Uh, just mentioned those. Uh, th there's a lot. My father-in-law was probably one of the greatest mentors I ever had. I, I, you know, we lost him in, in 2015 and that was a, a, a tremendous loss in my life, but he was a gentleman. He was a great businessman. He was a great Mason and people are great Masons because of what they exemplify, not necessarily because he's a great presiding officer or he's a great ritualist or anything else, but he, he exemplified our organization. He was wonderful. You know, he, I, again, it's like Jim asked about friendships or how many friendships have you developed? I, there's so many I couldn't tell you. And, and same thing with mentors. I, I try to learn something from everybody. And I mentioned Chance Chapman, if you've ever worked, you've got kids that are involved in youth organizations. You, you know this. These kids, they're smart. And if you give them a chance, you can learn from them, probably, and speaking for myself, probably more than I can impart to them. They, they're very smart. They're very, they, they, they're like a sponge. And they absorb everything. And, and they can impart it for the most part. And uh, gosh, you know, I, it, Chance was one of 19 state master counselors that I got to work with. 
uh, we were, my wife, Linda, and I were involved with Rainbow. We got to meet a lot of very smart girls. And when you, you chair the Masonic Youth uh, Committee, uh, um, you meet a lot of smart kids. You go to Masonic, Masonic Youth Weekend, these kids get to plan that and execute it. I tried to stay out of the way because I was only a hindrance to them. You know, I want to hear your plans. I'll help you execute it. But other than that, you're on your own. And we were there only to supervise, not, not to tell them what to do. These kids are smart. They know what to do. They just need a little guidance. That's it. So I, I learned probably more from the kids than they ever learned from me. So a uh, serious question this time, Bart. Um, uh, with what we have going on today, and, and I asked uh, Jerry Kirby the same question, and I, and I asked our current grandmaster the same question. So uh, the York Rite bodies, being the Grand Chapter, the Grand Council, and the Grand Commandery, uh, on paper, they appear to be sovereign bodies. Uh, do you feel they are indeed sovereign, or are they, in some unofficial capacity, subordinate to the Grand Lodge of Texas? It's, it's a great, great question, Jim, but um, they, they are sovereign bodies, yes. However, Article 225 in the Grand Lodge of Texas statutes clearly says that the Grand Lodge allows them to meet in Masonic buildings. And in that respect, they are subordinate to the Grand Lodge of Texas. I, I learned that lesson, it was a very tough lesson, but I learned that lesson in 2006 opposing Grandmaster Brian R. Dodson uh, in the issue of the Job's Daughters. I don't know if you remember that or not, but that was, um, and I got to say, uh, Reese and I and uh, James uh, Rodriguez and very other people that were super, super active with, at that time, with our youth uh, stood up against Brian and his desire to remove the acknowledgement of Job's daughters to meet in, or the allowing Job's daughters to uh, meet in lodges. It's, uh, it's the only, or at least at that time, was the only youth organization that required a Masonic tie to be a member for those girls. And uh, it just, it was hurtful at the time, but after the fact, I'll be the first one to tell you, Brian was right, that the organization was doing some thing, that their main body, not, not locally, but their main body was doing some things that was um, not in the best interest of the girls. They weren't um, enforcing their, their adult training and taking responsibility for them. And, and it just, it wasn't fitting in the Grand Lodge of Texas. It became more of a, a liability than an asset. But I, I, um, I, I don't want to lob the Grand Commander and all the other appendant bodies in with Job's Daughters because they do follow the law. Uh, but no, I, in that respect, Article 225 is very clear that they are subordinate really to the Grand Lodge. I do remember that when that happened back in 06. Uh, I was pretty active then, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it caught a lot of people off guard. It's a lot of folks like myself who uh, weren't active with our youth groups right. viewed that as, wow, what yeah. the heck is going on behind the scenes? But after it all came out, it made a lot of sense. Yes. But but from a, from a layperson, when it came to youth groups at that time, uh, I, I remember wondering, what the heck is going on? Well, many, almost everybody knew that Brian and I were very close. Even, I mean, long before that, we, we met drilling together on a commandery drill team uh, years before that. But uh, Brian was right. And it wasn't just Brian. Uh, he had a lot of people that were, you know, helping him devise the decision that he came up with. And, and he was clearly right. I think the problem with me and Reese probably and James Rodriguez is that we wanted to believe that Job's Daughters International would make the changes and they did not. But uh, Brian saw through that and thankfully he did because it could have been a whole lot different in a, in a worse case. The, it was hurtful at the time, but God, I'm glad that Brian prevailed. So I hate to use a cliche, but that's what I'm going to do. So sometimes when you're involved in something, you can't see the big picture. The Correct. closer you are to it, you can't see the forest for the tree, so to speak. Yes, sir. So I think Brian was able to see that to where folks who were 
lack of a better phrase, on the front lines didn't see it. Exactly. No, you're totally correct. All right. Thanks, Bart. Um, the next question I have is almost a little bit of a follow-up about that. Uh, my question for you is how do you feel uh, as a past Grand Commander, right, and, and having to work with the different York Rite bodies and come to some sort of working relationship, how do you feel that the York Rite bodies should work together? Well, uh, without taking any of their self-identity away from them, theoretically, they should work hand in glove. I, I always liked, uh, this is several years ago, but when they would have the, the York Rite conferences, all three bodies would participate. And it, to me, uh, if they were done correctly, that you could see that intertwining of the, of the orders and, and the degrees. Um, we've kind of gotten away from that. Uh, and I don't, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying but for people like me, when you see all three representatives, it didn't have to be the presiding officer, but it, it was usually an elected officer, uh, come and bring a presentation. You could see how, it, and, and if they had communicated before this all started, this is what we're going to do. This is the goal, et cetera, et cetera. I think it added a lot to it. Uh, and that understanding, I, I just, they'll, they're all strong when they stand alone, but to me, they are all stronger when they stand together, and uh, it, it paints, like Jim just mentioned this, this term or this phrase, it, it paints a better picture of the whole York Wright um, organization when when we do things together if that makes sense I, I you know they're all they all have beautiful work in them don't get me wrong but they all lead one to the other to the other and I just I think we're, if we're not careful and we try to do everything on our own individually we're going to lose that if I mean if we're not careful so all right thank you Bart yes sir all right um my question is a little bit of a piece of advice for me and Ricky coming up through this line, but what do you feel was the hardest thing you dealt with in the Grand Commandery line? And then what was the most enjoyable aspect as well? Well, it, it, well, it, in, let me do the enjoyable thing first. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, that's multi, that's a multi answer question. I mean, I loved, the grand conclaves. I love that. The, it was like a reunion, a family reunion. And even though people are busy, Hey, I've got to run to this meeting or I've got to go do this, or I've got to go drill or now the team's out practicing. It, it just, it's like at home, everybody's running every direction, but you're still together. I, I like that. I loved visiting, even though you were there on business to inspect the commanderies, I loved visiting the commanderies and traveling to them. And they just bent over backwards to, make me feel at home and they did that's what they did and and I and I always did I was never I never felt out of place um I had, that sometimes that they they were when you would show up as a grand officer they were somewhat intimidated maybe from a previous year or two but once you got the air cleared it was like homecoming and uh, it was wonderful um the, the only incident that I can think of, and I'm not going to mention any particulars, but when you have to go to a commandery to settle a dispute that's not, uh, they're not able to settle for themselves, that's, that's, I don't want to say it's, it, it's just a little disappointing maybe, but we got past it and we got everything settled and it worked out just fine. But uh, sometimes uh, you have one person or maybe a couple of people that are uh, maybe have the wrong idea of why we're there or have the wrong idea of what we're supposed to be doing. They, they, you know, that's why I, in my opinion, that's why they say guard well the West. Um, you, when you bring in a new member, make sure that that's the member you want. I mean, that's, that's what the investigation committees are supposed to do. And sometimes one or two slip through. This is not a, a kingdom by no means. I mean, the commanders and the grand commanders, uh, they, there's, 
they are authoritarian, don't get me wrong, but they're still elected by their peers. So um, that's, um, that was probably the hardest thing was to step into somebody else's uh, commandery at that time. And um, look, this is, I've listened to both sides and this is what we're going to do because no matter what you decide, somebody's going to get caught in the, in the, in the jetsam. Hey, Bart. So, I'm uh, sorry. One, go one, ahead, Billy. One, la one last thing uh, you had said, uh, uh, there was, I can't remember whose question it was. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe it was Billy's question. The advice that I might offer, um, learn to be flexible because just because you're the grand officer doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen sometimes. <laughs> so be flexible, uh, learn to use your ears more so than your mouth. Um, that was a hard lesson for me. Uh, I'm sure that other people probably suffer the same thing. As my mother said, God gave me two ears and one mouth for a reason. And, uh, so I think that's probably a big thing. And, and, to uh, heed the advice of, doesn't mean you have to use it, but listen uh, to the advice of, they don't have to be previous grand commanders. So there's a lot of smart people out there. Billy, you're one of them. That uh, You're not a past grand commander, but you're, you're smart. I, listen, I heard your presentation at the uh, Texas Lodge of Research there in Fort Worth. You're, you're smart way past your, you know, way past people like me. So I think well, I think that's probably the biggest uh, biggest uh, piece of advice I'd have. Well, actually, in the, going back to when you were talking about guarding the Westgate, it reminded me of something that I saw in a chat today. Um, I'm in a like a Masonic education multi-state forum, and we have an admin chat. And one of the most profound things I've seen written or spoken in a while is one of the other admins had lamented. He said. Uh, white balls have done much more damage to the fraternity than black cubes ever did. Agreed. And I, I, I listen, that is a profound statement. I don't know who said it, but they're, they're very smart. They're right. It was me. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Hey, oh, so something else, Bart, I want to play off of something you just said. You talked about when you were a, a grand line officer in the grand commandery, you go to a grand commandery and people would, be confused as to why you were there yeah. and often think the worst. I want you to think about how a member of the committee on work feels <laughs> every time he goes to a lodge uh, and no one ever is thrilled to see that person. So, uh, yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying there. Yes. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate to the extent because regardless of what your position is, uh, you're still a member of that fraternity and you're there to enjoy the social aspect as much as you are to do a job. Absolutely. And uh, I can only imagine that for the first five or 10 minutes that you're at your function, they, 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 they have a wide girth around you. They, they, they avoid you much more than a, an arm's length. I guarantee it until they warm up to you. Yeah. And part of that is still the officer as well. The officer has a duty to make everyone feel as comfortable as they can. Uh, I think personally, right. uh, we're, no. we're there to, we're there to, we're there to break bread together. We're there to do a job, but at the same time, we're still brothers or Sir Knights or companions, uh, both before, during, and after. Right. And the Committee on Work and the Grand Officers or the Templar Instruction folks, they, they're they there to enhance the commandery or, or the lodge or, or whatever the organization is. You're not there to hurt them. You're there to, uh, to enhance their work. That's it. And that, that's the biggest obstacle that I've seen. I took this job almost three years ago and uh, I've done, I've worked very hard uh, to change that persona in, in the region that I'm in, DFW and Northeast Texas and North Central Texas, including Waco, uh, to change that persona that I, I'm here to, to be your asset, not here to tell you what you're doing wrong or to enforce anything. Uh, so it's a, uh, and the grand commandery is to the same extent. I mean, you're there to, hold the commanderies to a standard, but you're at the same time, you're there to en enhance them and to give them opportunities to improve, to meet those standards, not, yes, to, yes. not to enforce, so to speak. Right. So uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, Bart, for the next question. Uh, 
guys, I'm sorry. I know we got Chance here, we got <laughs> Ricky here, and Bart's here. I am not the best Sir Knight. I'm just going to say it. Uh, I'm a past commander of two different commanderies. Wow. Uh, but I do not enjoy the commandery as much as I do the other avenues of our fraternity. Uh, uh, but I do give it 100% whenever I'm there. Uh, so, so, Bart, this next question for me is geared more towards the York Rock College, where I am more active in. And you served as grand governor a few years back. So thinking back to your tenure, both as grand commander or as grand governor, uh, is looking at what's going on today. We have a grand master of masons we have a, who was elected. We have a grand high priest. We have a grand master of the council. And we have a grand commander, all who were elected to a one-year term. So I'm going to exclude the sovereign grand inspector general from the Scottish Rack. He's not elected to a one-year term. And we have a handful of other appendant uh, York Rite bodies in Texas who were elected to mm -hmm. one-year terms. Mm -hmm. No one saw this when they were elected that COVID-19 would be a huge deal. Uh, and, and honestly, there's nothing anyone could have done to really prepare for what we're experiencing now. So with all of that aside, but with that in the back of your mind, when you were elected to grand, when you were installed as either grand commander or grand governor, and that term of office that you had, is there anything that you felt looking back on it, you could have prepared better for? Uh, in hindsight, knowing, knowing what happened, what, is there anything that you could have prepared better for? Uh, well, um, I'll start with the grand governor first, because that's going to be the easiest one. Uh, you, you, um, you get very little notice. It's an appointed position. Okay, and it's a two-year term if everything goes right. And if you do everything really good, then they give you another two-year term. Uh, so um, you get very little notice in advance, uh, maybe, maybe six months or so. But if you've been an active member in, I mean, and you've gone through the line, typically a, a, a deputy grand governor or a grand governor is a past governor. Not always, but most of the time. And um, it, if you can do, in our, I, I can only speak for my college here in Houston, but we were required at that, when I went through the line, you had to know your part. You didn't have to do anything else, just know your part. Well, by the time you become governor, you know all the parts. So they bank on you staying active and helping out with the ritual. So being grand governor, the only thing that you can really ask, you're asked to do is to visit the colleges. So there's not a whole lot of preparation to that. Uh, there is some time management issues because the, the biggest uh, problem I ever had as grand governor was that there's 13 colleges and they all, they all have to have an annual meeting where they elect officers. So you have to time that to try to be there if possible. If you can't, then you send the deputy grand governor. But I made all of mine. I, I missed one uh, because I got sick. And then, um, but besides that, it, it's a time management issue. That's the being grand, grand commander. I think looking back, if I could have prepared more, it, it's a mindset, uh, Jim. It, it's um, you get, sometimes you get a little disappointed uh, that maybe the results that you were trying to attain, you don't quite attain. I, 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 I don't, I don't like losing. I don't like not meeting my goals. Uh, so you have to prepare yourself for that because so many things, as you know, uh, we have <laughs> in Freemason, we have a lot of moving parts and, uh, I can, you know, if, if one of the wheels in the, in the cog, or one of the cogs breaks in the wheel, then the wheel stops turning. So you have to prepare yourself for that. Maybe I, I mean I mean I'm, I don't know that I'm answering your question right. I just the preparation is um, mainly dealing with people and trying to get them to cooperate with not just your plans but 
with what's required of them as an officer. So, I mean, that, that's really about it. I, I don't know that, let me tell you, these guys that are running for office, like Chance and Ricky and, and uh, you know, even the ones in between, Gary and, and all the others, they're, they're, they were more qualified to be a grand officer than I was. So, um, I, I, you know, they're, they're totally prepared, I believe more so than I was. So I, I, you know, I hope, I don't think I'm answering your question the way you wanted me to, but I, I, I just don't know if you know the ritual and you, I mean, not necessarily that, but how to govern. I think that's important. It, you, it's, this is a people organization and chance, no offense, but this is a business. I mean, anytime you've got this many people and there's money involved, there's, there, it's somewhat of a business. So I, I did want to address that thing you mentioned earlier. Just so the record's clear, I do think there is a business aspect yeah. of it, but that's not the main focus of the fraternity. No, I totally agree with you. <laughs> is, do you have anything you'd like to leave us with before we wrap this podcast up? or this video cast, whatever you want to call it. It's really not a podcast because yeah. we're using video technology. But anyway, anything you want to leave us with before we wrap it up? I, uh, number one, uh, I appreciate and thank all of you for inviting me to participate. Uh, this is kind of a new deal, especially for me. Uh, as I said earlier, it's only the fourth time I've done one of these Zoom meetings, but I love it. I think it's great. Um, I think if, if I could... Um, I think when we come out of this, Jim, or, or all of y'all, uh, I think when we come out of this, I think we're going to be stronger. I think we're actually going to be glad to see each other and uh, participate with our lodges, chapters, councils, and commanderies. Uh, because we've, you, you know, as they say, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I believe that this coronavirus may have successfully done that. I do agree that some of our older members may be a little more shy to come back in a large group, but I think we, as long as we're careful, I think that we're going to enjoy uh, somewhat of a, a, a blooming of the flower uh, again in our organization. And I think if I could just change one thing, I would love to see our, our lodges, chapters, councils, and commanders be more active in the public. I think the public has a, kind of an idea about Masons and, and, and the opinion organizations. But I think if we show them the good things that we do by actually doing it for them and what I'm, you know, one of, well, anyway, I know we're running out of time, but I, I just think that the more we involve the public in some of our ceremonies and some of the actions that we do in the lodges and the chapters and councils and commanderies, the better we're all going to be as far as membership because everybody wants to be a member of a, an organization that's doing something good. I just think that people like to be a member of some, a winning team or an organization that's doing good for other people. Um, that's just my opinion. Bart, thank you very much uh, for both your insight uh, and most importantly for joining us this evening. Oh, it's, it's I was intimidated by y'all. You, this is a learned group of guys, and uh, in that respect, I just didn't quite fit in. Uh, Chance, any comments? Closing comments? No, sir. Great, great meeting. Billy, how about yourself? Uh, I just want to thank you, Bart, for uh, being generous with your time and joining us here. Sure. And uh, thank everyone who is uh, tuning in and, and watching or, or listening to this. I, we appreciate it. Uh, Billy, I did have one request of you. When you edit this, mm -hmm. I want to be 10 years younger and 40 pounds lighter with a little <laughs> bit more hair. All right. Let me check to see what filters we have. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, I'm going to toss it to Billy for the fraternal quote for the quote of the week. And then we'll toss it to Ricky who started us off to close us out. All right. Thank you. Uh, so the quote of the week actually uh, comes from, the Grand Conclave of Wisconsin held on January 18, 1871, and it is this. It is an old and homely saying, but nevertheless true. Birds of a feather flock together. If we want the best of men to apply for admission to our order, we must attract them by placing their peers in the foreground. For mankind judge a society by its leaders, as the passers-by do a merchant stock by the kind and quality of goods displayed in the window. And that was from Sir Knight Albert Carpenter, who was Deputy Grand Commander of Wisconsin at that conclave. 
Uh, he was elected to serve as grand commander and actually elected to serve for three consecutive years. Good quote. Fantastic. Again, Bart, we want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your Sunday to uh, come and hang out with us uh, via Zoom. Uh, our great panel, I want to say thanks to all the guys, Don Paul, Chance Chapman, Jim Rumsey, and Billy Hamilton for uh, taking time away from their families and uh, join us on this Zoom and putting this all together. Thanks a lot, Billy. You do always do a great job on putting this together. Um, it, you can contact us at email at uh, C H A T, which is chat at yorkwrighttexas.org. Uh, if you got any questions, you can also uh, look up Billy Hamilton and send him questions via his uh, Facebook or however you want to contact him. I don't care. Uh, one thing I want to say uh, that Bart has said to me before, because uh, I'm a little bit different than a lot of people, and he always told me, never change. Never lose your sense of humor. Uh, remember, guys, I want you all to stay safe out there. We look forward to getting back in our lodges, chapter councils, commanderies, our shrines, our Scottish Rite organizations, and all the appendant bodies. So stay safe so we can see you down the road and that the uh, the strength and the grip is only as powerful as the love in the heart. So uh, keep that love in your heart so that uh, whenever we're able to shake hands again, we can feel the power of the grip within our fraternity. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.